to go work. away and don't bother me. This paper can't afford to employ you. You've cost us two libel actions, one prosecution for defamation of character and the best advertising account in the business. I hope it doesn't mean you're dissatisfied with my work, sir. Can I take my trousers off as well? I'd say, really. Who the devil asked you in here? Get out and shut the door. Can't I even have a suit fitted in private? Well, this is an excellent opportunity, sir, for me to express my point of view. Your point of view? Your point! Hello? Yes, yeah, speaking. Hmm? Oh, hello, George. Ah, oh, yeah. I'm very well indeed. Hmm? Oh, yes, trying to. Can't get any real reporters these days. Hmm? Oh, yes, Maastricht. When? Tomorrow, you say? Uh huh. In the morning, I suppose. Yes, well, thanks very much for getting me the information. Fifteen years. It's a long time. Come in. Put it down there. Maastricht comes out tomorrow. Does that mean anything to that dim brain of yours? Maastricht? Who's he? Someone who made the headlines 15 years ago, when you were a revolting child in a pram, and I was doing your job ten times better than you could, even if you had brains. It's too tight. Maastricht gave me my first real chance. I wonder. Look, if I could explain about the other day, G.S., I'd like to make it clear it wasn't my fault. I want Maastricht's story of the past 15 years. Or from 100 pounds for the story. Don't make the sleeves too long. But who is this Maastricht guy? Can you give me any line on him? Maastricht was a man who, in my opinion, deserved something better than he had. What did he have? A wife, a kid, no money, and a belief in his fellow man which let him down in the end. He was a good worker. He had a job which would have killed you in a week. What job? He was a stevedore. And to save you turning that up, it means that he was one of those men who loads ships on the docks. He worked just below Tower Bridge, and he worked fairly regularly. For in 1930, the world hadn't yet gone mad, and the docks were busy. Hello, Hello, Hello where's your mum? Gone to the shops. Gone to the shops? Only time to do shopping, isn't it, eh? That's what she said. So all the shops will be closed by now. Fred, you do love me, don't you? Of course I do. Fred, take me away. I can't go on. Meeting her like this and having to leave you, go back to him. Sometimes I think he knows everything. About us, I mean. You're funny, too. How about coming out with me tonight? Oh, you know I'd like to, but how can I? Oh, tell him you're going to the pictures with a girlfriend. He'll look after the kid. He'll have a couple of drinks and go down to the paddock. You know you like dancing. Yes, I suppose he found out. Oh, well, if he does, he won't take you dancing himself, will he? Have a bit of fun while you can, that's what I say. Come on, guys. Not afraid of him, are you? Well, your old dad's not too bad a cook, is he, eh? Jolly good. What do you do at school today? Sums. Did you get them right? No. What? My little girl can't add up. I can, but I get the wrong answers. Just like you. Like me? Why, I was always top of the class. What do you mean, like me? Well, I heard Mrs. Peterson say she didn't know why you couldn't put two and two together. You've been a long time. We've had our supper. Well, sorry, I met Mrs. Moore. You know how she talks. Couldn't get away from her. What about a cup of tea? There's some in the pot. No, I haven't got time. Time for what? Well, Mrs. Moore wants me to go to the pictures with her tonight. Oh? Huh? You going? Yes, I think so. You don't mind, do you? They got one of those new talking pictures on at the Empire. No, you go along and enjoy yourself. Change will do you good. Why don't you take Jill with you? You'd like to go, wouldn't you, Jill? Oh, yes, please, Mummy. Don't be silly, Jill. You know, it's long past your bedtime already. Go on, Doris. Let her go. It's Saturday tomorrow. She hasn't got to go to school. I'll tell you what, I'll treat both of you, shall I? No. It'll mean keeping her up too late. You ought to have more sense, Tom. But if you're a good girl, Jill, then go to bed now. Perhaps I'll take you next week. Oh. Maybe your mum's right, eh? Now, go on, off you go. If you behave yourself, I might find you a penny some sweets in the morning. Good night. Don't forget old Jack. Good night, Daddy. Good night, Mummy. Good night, dear. I'll come up in a minute and tuck you in. Well, I'm off now, Tom. Well, you going already? Yes, it starts at seven. I don't suppose I'll be late, but don't wait up for me. All right, will you buzz up and enjoy yourself? No, Tom. I've just done my lips. Well, good night. Good 
Hello, Sam. Sorry, laundry late. You're so busy. That's all right. Come inside and have a smoke. What? Uh... It's all right. The missus has gone out. You know. What's her call? Sam, you know, I often think it's funny that some of these swells spend more money on one meal than we earn in a week. Confucius, he say, many different flowers needed to make garden beautiful. Mm. Mm. Your friend Confucius has got an answer for everything, hasn't he, eh? Confucius, a great consoler. Consoler? What do you want with consolement? You must be making a packet of money with that laundry of yours. Confucius say, little bird of happiness cannot fly when winds weigh down with gold. <laughs> Not much chance of us being way down like that, is it, Sam, eh? <laughs> Hello, Tom. Hello, Mrs. Uh, come in. Hello. You know Sam, don't you, Mrs. Oh, Moore? of course I know Sam. You saw her in. No. She said she was going to pictures with you. With me? Yeah. I haven't seen her all day. It's funny. Sworn she said she was... No, it must be some mistake. Anyway, Tom, tell her I brought back the dish she lent me with many thanks. Yeah, that's right. Well, I must go on now and get me old man's supper. You know what he is, which isn't on the table waiting for him. Good night, Sam. Right. <laughs> Good night. Good night, Tom. Enjoy the pictures? Of I did. Did uh, Mrs. Moore enjoy it? Yes, I think so. Sandy came in to keep me company. Oh, I see. Me go now. Okay, Sam. Oh, uh, by the way, Mrs. Moore called in this evening to return that dish you lent her. Good night, Sam. Good night, Tom. Hello, Tom. Can I have a breather? Good luck. Didn't know you lived around here. Nice place you got. What are you up to, Fred Smith? Me? Nothing. How long have you known Fred Smith? What do you mean? He was hanging about outside when I went out. Well, what's he got to do with me? What did you get to the pictures with tonight? What are you trying to get at, Tom? I ask you, who were you with at the pictures? I told you, Mrs. Green. You said Mrs. Moore. Are you trying to make me out a liar? I told you, Mrs. Green. And if you don't believe me, why don't you go down and ask her? Maastricht should have pitched his wife out there and then. But he wouldn't admit he was right, even to himself. These things might happen to the man next door or the chap across the road, but not to Tom Maastricht. That was unthinkable. Put that down! There's no point in letting it get cold, G.S. Then what did he do, beat his wife up? No. But when he went to work next day, suspicion and doubt went with him. Thank you. 
let him talk in pictures, Tom. No. I did. Saw the one they got at the Empire. Ah? Uh, last night? How could I? You saw me yourself last night. You know, I think them talking pictures are a good idea. Don't have to keep reading all the time. See, I'm not a scholar like you, Tom. <laughs> yeah. What's the matter with you? Something wrong at home? Having trouble with your wife? Yes, to the young Tom. If that had hit him, it would have run him well killed him. Yes, for a good job, too. Don't try and find me, because I'm not coming back ever. Doris. The prologue was over and the curtain was up on the first act. Maastricht was bowled over. The unthinkable thing had happened and he wasn't ready for it. He didn't take it as you or I would have done, in red-hot anger or cold grief. He took it like a man who sees a volcano for the first time and says, I don't believe it. Something happened to Maastricht in those first few minutes that nobody will ever know about. He should have gone to bed, of course, but he didn't. He went out instead, along a road that he was never meant to travel. Hello, Doris. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Doris. What do you have? What you got in the bag, a body? Done your old man in at last? No, but I've left him. You're kidding me. Doris, you never. Oh, come on, Fred, let's get out of here. Now, no, wait a minute. Fred. Fred, you did mean what you said about us, didn't you? Of course I did. Have a drink. And Fred, I've left him for you. Don't you understand? Have a drink. Oh, hello, Tom. Is Jill with you? She is. I've just put her to bed, poor lamb. What's that wife of yours up to? Fine goings on, I must say. Is Doris here? Of course she's not. I gave her a piece of my mind, I can tell you. Leaving her home and child like this. Oh, Tom, you're too soft with her. Did she tell you where she was going? She did not, but I can give a good guess. She's been carrying on with that fella for weeks. Disgraceful, I call it. What do you mean by carrying on, Mrs. Moore? What I say, the whole street's talking about it. But you're so slow, you can't see what's going on under your very nose. Swallowing all that stuff about her being out with me. <laughs> She's my wife. Is she? Hello, Tom. Why don't you do something before it's too late? What can I do about it? You can go and buy yourself a drink at the North Star, can't you? Well, what are you waiting for?
past that was seen with Mr. Smith. I'm still wondering where you come into this story, G.S. Seems to know an awful lot about it for somebody who wasn't there. I know all about it because, although I was only a cub reporter in those days, I happened to have the rather old-fashioned idea that my job was to get stories instead of missing trains. There was hardly anybody connected with the business that I didn't talk to at some time or the other. Maastricht seemed to have forgotten all about what I'd done. Started to wander around looking for Smith. His job didn't seem to matter anymore. In the meantime, of course, the neighbors had started to chatter. Well, you can say what you like, but Fred wouldn't just go off like that without telling me. Oh, good morning, Sergeant Powell. Can I get you a glass or something? No, thanks, Mr. Hancock. This is an official visit. No complaints about the house, I hope. No, not this time. I'm trying to check on the movements of Frederick Smith. And I thought maybe you could help. Him? No, I, uh, I haven't seen him for nearly two weeks. No, neither has anyone else. If you ask me, he won't never be seen anymore. Oh, what makes you say that? Well, he was my lodger. I knew him better than most people. Fred wouldn't have gone Then you must be Mrs. Green. That's right. How'd you do? I was coming to see you this afternoon, Mrs. Green. Maybe you can save me a journey. When did you see him last? Nearly two weeks ago. And he was being chased out of this very bar by someone with a ruddy great sword. Mm -hmm. He was being chased by someone, was he? Yes. No names, no pack drill, they say. But since you've asked me point blank, I suppose I've got to tell you it was Tom Masterick. Masterick? <laughs> it's rather a long story, really. Doris Masterick was a great friend of mine. Tom, give her a dog's life. That's right. Just a moment, Mrs. Green. Tom Maastricht wouldn't stop at nothing. If ever a man had murder in his eyes, he did. Attacked him without a word. Went fighting mad. Took my Chinese sword. Never found it again. I don't know what to think. But this I will say. If Tom done it, it's gone clean out of his head. I'm sure he don't remember nothing. Well, after all, you can hardly blame the poor fella. The way she was going on, it was something disgraceful, so it was. He very good man. Very good. If he killed, had good reason. I told him, if that ogre did him, he would have killed him, I said. And he said a good job, too. Hello? Take the Sergeant Howell. This is the station sergeant from South End speaking. Yes? The body of the man, answering to a circulated description, has been found on the estuary mud flats. the beginning of the end for Maastricht. Mrs. Green talked and she said plenty. So did others. Some of it true, but most of it the release of a repressed desire for drama. Mr. Maastricht? Yes? Thomas Maastricht? Yes, what do you want? We're police officers. We'd like to have a word with you. Ah. Well, I'll be getting along. It's so long, Tom. Mm -hmm. Yeah, see you later. Oh, come in. Well, Maastricht, I'm afraid it's my duty to charge you with the willful murder of Frederick Smith. I must warn you that anything you say will be taken down and may be used in evidence at your trial. Did you see that man? What man? That fellow on that ship. It was Fred Smith. Take it easy, Master. But I tell you, I've just seen Fred Smith. Yes, of course. Get must him all right. But don't you believe me? Anyway, I got the name of the ship he was on. The Chester. Chester. I don't suppose Master could ever been in a motor car in his life. And his first trip in one was for a journey to prison. Well, what happened at the trial, G.S.? What happened? Well, there were really two trials going on at the one time. The official legal one at the Old Bailey with all the purple and ermine and all the majesty of the law, and a more informal one in the pubs at Limehouse where he lived. Now, Mrs. Green, did Mrs. Maastricht speak to you at any time about her married life? Oh, often. She said being married to Tom Maastricht was misery. He was so violent and sudden. You mean he used physical violence against his wife? Yes, sir. Thank you, Mrs. Green. Millie Green hadn't got much to say for Tom Maastricht, had she? Oh, it's funny. He always seems so quiet-like. 
<laughs> it's always the quiet one. Did you see that on the very day of the murder, he threatened to do Smith with a loading hook? Yeah, instead of that, he goes and uses my Chinese sword. Uh, Malayan sword, old man. I hear an old Sam from a Chinese laundry going to be called tomorrow. Who's going to believe him? He's a heathen, isn't he? Sam Wang Si swears by his ancestors that should he, in speaking the truth, manipulate it in such a way as to mislead his hearers, then may his soul be shattered, even as the three sources have been shattered, and his spirit be for all eternity lost to the assembly of his ancestors. You are Sun Wang Si of the Celestial Laundry, Limehouse. This uh, Limehouse Si and uh, Sun Wang Si. Quite right. You were the prisoner's neighbor and knew him well. The witness says, yes, he knows the prisoner very well indeed. And in your opinion, is the prisoner a good man? Very, very good. And a good father and husband? He very good father. Very, very, very good. Then you think that he is not the type of man who could willfully kill a fellow creature? The witness says that such was Master Rick's integrity of character that uh, he might feel himself bound to destroy anyone he knew to be evil. But fancy letting a Chinaman throw saucers about in court. A farce, I call it. Well, perhaps things will start to happen as soon as old Master gets into the box, old man. And that was the last you saw of him. That's right. He was feeling strong towards the light, isn't he? Not far to go. I see. Thank you. Crossley, in your evidence, you've admitted that you left the wharf before Smith actually reached the lighters. Yet you seem certain, absolutely certain, that he came to no harm. How is that? Because he was swimming strong. But even the strongest swimmers are liable to cramp. So in effect, your assertion that Smith didn't die that night is no more than conjecture. No, he's still alive. But that is merely your opinion. No! How can you possibly be so definite? Because I've seen him since. And it doesn't matter what you or anybody else says, it won't make any difference because I've seen him since. I tell you, I've seen him. You've seen him? That, of course, is interesting. Particularly, as a few minutes ago you told the court that the last you saw of Smith was him swimming towards some lighters. When did you see him? When I was with the detective in the car. Oh, I saw Fred Smith all right, and he was on a ship called the Chester. You told the detective sergeant of this? Of course I did, and he said he checked up and he was told there was no boat with the name of Chester in the port of London. That had been for donkey's years. But I've seen it. I've tell you, I've seen it. You know, I've got a nasty feeling that he's going to get off. Members of the jury, are you agreed upon your verdict? We are. And do you find the prisoner Thomas Maastricht guilty or not guilty of murder? We find him guilty. And is that the verdict of you all? It is. However, my lord, the members of the jury wish me to express their strong recommendation to mercy. Prisoner at the bar, you stand convicted of murder. Have you anything to say why the court should not give you judgment of death according to the law? Yes. Well, I'm innocent. I'm innocent! I'm innocent! Don't! Don't you understand I'm innocent? Don't you understand? These lies! These lies! Words! 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 And when I left the court, his voice was still ringing in my ears. Well, he appealed, of course. Yes, and the appeal was turned down. So we started a reprieve campaign. We even took the case onto the leader page with a strong pro-Mastric bias. 
In five days, we had the country with us, and our circulation went up by about 10%. Maastricht became a very famous man. For a short time, we got him his reprieve, and the world forgot him. They took him down to Dartmoor, and he's been there ever since. Poor devil. Second of the time. What happened to his wife and kid? Doris Maastricht never came back. The child was adopted with Maastricht's consent and went into a good home. Well, maybe that's a good angle, G.S. Perhaps I should see the kid as well. No. Leave her alone. She can't help you. Maastricht's the man you want to see. I wonder what it's like coming back after all those years. That's what you've got to find out if you want to keep your job. Find out what he used to think about in prison. Get his angle on justice, the penal system, that sort of thing. It's up to you to find out what 15 years hard labor has done for Maastricht. You think having a nice friendly chap with a ghost? Suppose he won't talk. Then you, Mr. Rogers, will be out of a job by this time tomorrow. What the devil do you think you're being paid for? It's your job to make people talk, isn't it? After 15 years of silence, Maastricht will be only too glad to talk to anyone, even to you. Give him a hundred pounds for the story. And now, if you've quite finished digesting my lunch, perhaps you get out of that chair. I have work to do. You can get a photograph of Maastricht from records. And be at Paddington early. Maastricht won't miss the train. <laughs> Yeah, but this train only goes as far as Plymouth. It doesn't say anything about London at all. Wait a minute, there's somebody we can ask. Pardon me, sir. Is this the right track for the London train? Uh, yes, but uh, you'll have to change at Plymouth. Oh, thanks. I'll sure be glad to see a big city again. Yes, it's pretty grim around these parts. You live here, sir? Uh, I did, but not anymore. I see you have a big prison here. We saw some of the boys working out in the moor yesterday. Tough-looking guys they were, too. Any chance of getting inside and having a look around, sir? Well, not unless you do a murder first, I'm afraid. <laughs> Have you seen inside, sir? Yes. But then, you see, I am a murderer. Come on, Joe. Let's go. I tell you, G.S., he must have missed the train. There's no sign of him anywhere. No, really? Maybe he's waiting for you under the big clock with a Japanese chrysanthemum in his hand so that you can recognize him. <coughs> Sorry about all that. One of my star reporters. Well, Maastricht, what are your plans now that you're free? Well, I... I came along to ask you about my daughter. Is she all right? Is she... Happy? Yes, very. Of course, she's grown up. You wouldn't recognize her. I, um, I suppose there's no chance of seeing her just once. I knew this had to happen one day. Now, look here, Maastricht. You know how I've always looked on this case of yours. And when I adopted Jill all those years ago, I made up my mind that she should never be hurt by the Maastricht affair, and she never has. You agreed to her taking my surname, and my wife and I have brought her up as our own child. She doesn't even remember her real name. She's happy. And now, you want me to destroy that happiness by producing an ex-convict as her real father. Now, don't misunderstand me, Maastricht. I have no wish to hurt you. I'm only thinking about Jill. But can't you see that in five minutes you could destroy 15 years of happiness? Why not leave things as they are? I'm sorry. You're quite right, Mr. Sullivan. I know that you can do so much more for her that it... It isn't that. It's, well... I had very little else to think about all the time I was in there. But, uh, Perhaps it is better your way. I'm glad. Now, how about you? You'll be wanting a job. Maybe I can help. No. No. I won't bother you any further. You've done quite enough for me already. Hello, Daddy. Hope I'm not interrupting something frightfully important. 
Look, darling, I've just seen an absolute dream of a hat. Give me ten pounds and I'll go away quietly. I do hope you'll forgive us, Mr... No, uh, I'd like you to meet my, my daughter, Jill. This is Mr. Maastricht, a very old friend of mine. How do you do? Yes, I, I'm pleased to meet you, Miss Sullivan. It's the hardest thing in the world to make this father of mine write a cheque. I, I hope you don't treat your daughter so harshly. What about the five pounds I gave you on Monday? I bought gloves with that. That's why I've got to have a hat to match. Well, this is the last you're getting out of me, young lady. Now run along. I'm busy. <laughs> well, uh, I'm going, if you excuse me. Uh, goodbye, Miss... Uh... Goodbye. Goodbye, Mr. Sullivan. Goodbye, Maastricht. Don't forget to come and see me if I can help at any time. Oh, and by the way, uh, one of my staff will be contacting you about a matter that might interest you. Have a chat with them. Yes. Thank you. Seems a nice old man. Who is he? Oh, just someone I did business with many years ago. You're a nice old man, too. When you forget your silly old newspaper. And stop this mania for buying things. You shouldn't print such nice advertisements. Well, look who's here. Hello. Why aren't you out on some tremendous scoop? News is where you find it, you know. Sure, it is if you know where to look. You try searching for a man you've never seen who doesn't arrive on a non-existing train that comes in at the wrong platform and see where you get. Oh, Peter, have you fallen down on the job again? What is it this time? Nothing. Just a murderer. A murderer? Mm -hmm. Oh, Peter, don't be so infuriated. A real murder at last and you stand around here wasting time? Why aren't you out looking for clues or something? Because this particular murder happened about 15 years ago. And the man who did it came out of prison today. I supposed to see him and get a story. Why didn't you? Oh, you know, you get more like your old man every day. Can I help it if this Maastricht guy doesn't show up? Who? Maastricht, the man I'm supposed to see. What does he look like? How do I know? Well, I've got a 15-year-old photograph. He's probably going to beard or something by now. No. No, he hasn't grown a beard. How do you know? He's just left Daddy's office. You must have passed him on the stairs. Seems a nice old man, not a bit like a murderer. You mean while I've been pacing up and down Paddington Station, he's been sitting in here in the office with G.S. They can't do this to me. This is my story. Which way did he go? Home, I suppose. Where does he live? <laughs> suppose you tell me. All right, I will, tomorrow. I'll ask my father tonight. He'll know. He knows everything. You're telling me. What would you do without me? <laughs> this is the fifth time I've saved you from getting the sack. Now, come on. Take me out and buy me a cup of tea. Okay. Got any money? Bitter, miss. Oh, miss, excuse me. Do you ever get a Mr. Fred Smith in here? Fred Smith? Yeah. No, don't know anyone of that name. He used to come in here, oh, quite a lot, about 15 years ago. A little before my time, I'm afraid. I see. Good gracious. Spike. Why, Tom? How you been keeping, eh? Oh, pretty well. Yeah. Pretty well, you know. Yeah. What are you going to have? No, no, I've had my limit. You sure? Yes. Well, it's been a long time, Spike. Yes, you're right. How are you? Oh, not so bad. I see they've got a new landlord here. Oh, Robert's wife well, been here for 15 years. Oh, of course. What are you up to these days? Are you still down there at the wharf? No, they pensioned me off about 10 years ago. I'm not getting any younger, you know. I'm living with my married daughter now. You remember Lily? Yes, of course, of course. And you're still breeding canaries, I suppose? Yes, yeah, she lets me keep them in the backyard. Oh, I couldn't do without the old birds. I love to hear them sing. Yes. <laughs> Serenus canarius. I beg your pardon? I said Serenus canarius. That's the zoological term for canary. Blimey, anyone would think you've been away at college all this time instead of in... Uh... Well, yes, I have in a way, Spike. Have you ever thought about the power of words? No. I hadn't until this thing happened to me. But you know, they can change a man's whole life. They can make him happy, they can even kill him. Ah. It was words that did that for me, Spike. That's right. And when I was in there, I decided that I'd learn how to use them, too. So I wangled myself a job in the prison library. I had all the time in the world. 
And I used it. Reading. Reading, eh? You'll be surprised, Spike, at the things that men like us never have the chance of knowing. Now I know lots, lots of those things. And maybe one day I shall have a chance of talking to Mr. Crossley in his own language. Yes, that's right. By the way, do you ever see anything of Fred Smith these days? Now that I'm back, I've got to start looking for him, you know. Ah. Yes. Well, I must be getting along. Goodbye, Tom. Could I uh, talk to you for a moment? I think it's all right, Constable. Well, my man, what do you want? Uh, you, uh, you don't remember me, do you? To the best of my recollection, I've never seen you before. No. Maastricht's the name. Maastricht? Maastricht? No. Remember how you proved once that I killed a man by the name of Fred Smith? Thomas Masterick. Yes, I remember you now. And uh, have you just come out of... Uh... Yes. Uh, after 15 years, I've just come out. Well, I hope you're settling down all right. Allow me to wish you luck, Masterick. Uh, thank you, sir. Have you got a job? Yes, I have. What is it? Well, uh, I'm going to start proving things now. What do you mean? Suppose... I found Fred Smith alive and kicking. What would you say to that? Look, Maastricht, don't you think it would be best if you tried to forget the whole thing and start your life all over again? I was quite happy with my life before, only you took it away from me. I know that Fred Smith's alive and I'm going to find him. Well, if you should succeed, naturally, I should be very interested to hear of it. Don't worry, you, you will. Uh, how can I get in touch with you? Here, here's my card. Oh, yes. thank you, thank you. And uh, when I find Fred Smith, it will certainly prove how wrong you were, won't it? Yes, I think I can concede you that. Funny. Now one man has the power to take away another man's life and happiness. Just with a few words. Don't seem right to me, somehow. Why, it's Mr. Marsbrick, isn't it? Hello, Miss Sullivan. How nice of you to remember my name. Uh, you going in to see Daddy? Yes, uh, something I forgot to tell him the other day. Well, I'm afraid he's fearfully busy. You may have to wait a very long time. Why not come and have a cup of coffee with me? You see, there's something I'd like to ask you. But, uh... There's a funny little Italian place just along here, I think. Come on, let's go there. Thank you. I know it's frightfully rude of me dragging you off like this, but it's really important. I want you to do me a great favor. You see, we, that is my friend, if he doesn't get a story from you, he'll get the sack. He's a newspaper reporter, and he's been told to get the story of your life while you were in... in... In prison. That's what you're trying to say, isn't it? Well, yes, Mr. Master. Did your father say anything to you about me? Oh, no. No, he'd be furious if he knew I was here. I'm just trying to help Peter. That's the friend I was telling you about. You're rather an elusive person. We never thought we'd find you again. You'd get money for the story. They'd pay you well, I'm sure. They've got plenty. Is it so very important to you that your friend should get this story? Well, it, it would save him from getting the sack, and it might help him onto something really important next time. 
I see. After all, 15 lost years aren't very important, are they? Oh, I'm terribly sorry. I didn't mean it that way. Please I forgive know. me. I know. Of course, of course. He shall have the story. But uh, I'm afraid it's going to be rather dull. Oh, don't you worry about that. Pete will soon make it interesting. He's a good journalist, really, and he... Well, Father just won't give him a chance. Then we will, shall we? Dad is a dear, really. There couldn't possibly be a nicer father, but... Well, he's got printer's ink in his blood. He looks upon people as though they're just headlines. Does he think of you like that? Oh, no, he just spoils me. You see, I'm the only one who really understands him. What was he like all those years ago when you knew him? Oh, just the same, just the same. As a matter of fact, I, I was his first big story. And perhaps later on, I shall be able to give him an even bigger one. And what will that be? The last chapter of the Mastery case. Would you like to hear it? Hello. Do you always come home as late as this? Gee, well, what on earth? I've been freezing to death here for nearly two hours. Your landlady wouldn't let me wait in your room. What do you want? Look, Peter, when somebody commits a crime but doesn't really, and then later on they find out he didn't, because the dead man's really alive all the time, only he didn't come forward when he knew he wasn't dead, what would happen? Look, uh, suppose you go home and have a nice sleep and you'll feel better in the morning. Peter, stop talking nonsense and listen to what I'm saying. All right, go on. Now, first of all, have you written the Maastricht story yet? Of course I haven't. He just disappeared into the blue. I had a cup of tea with him today. You what? As I told you before, Mr. Rogers, news is just where you find it. This is no time for fooling. How did you find him? Did you get a story? I did better than that. Do you want to be in on the biggest scoop of the year? What do you mean? Maastricht never committed that murder. He's quite innocent. It's all a mistake. And now he's out of prison, he's going to prove it. And you ought to be the first one to know about it. This is the chance you've always wanted. Who's told you this beautiful fairy tale? Maastricht himself. I thought so. Did you ever know of a criminal that wasn't innocent in his own estimation? But, Peter, I know he's telling the truth. Oh, yes, yes. How much did he try and borrow? Well, if that's the way you're going to take it, I'm very sorry I've wasted your time. Thought it might help. No, well, it has. At least we know where he lives. Got his address. Oh, don't say you forgot to ask him. Oh, Peter, I'm terribly sorry. This other story seems so important. I, I never mm, thought... It doesn't matter. Oh, but it does. Wait a minute. He'd be out on ticket of leave, wouldn't he? And where would that take us? To the police, of course. Come on. Wait a minute. Where are we going? Limehouse. Yes, Yes, but... all right. I've got some money. Come on. Hello there. What do you want? Is this Brian's Wharf? That's right. Are you, uh, Mr. Woody? That's right. I was told that you might be able to help me. I, I'm looking for a fellow. Uh, he was a donkey man, and sometimes he worked ashore. Smith was his name, Fred Smith. Fred Smith, a donkey man. Did he happen to be a back-haired fella? That's right. Chap with a lot of gab, sarcastic luck? Yes, that's it. A bit on the short side and swaggered when he walked? That's right, that's him, yes, yes. Where should I find him? You won't. What do you mean? Because he's dead, see? Killed. Murdered. Years and years ago. You're a liar. You're a liar. He wasn't murdered. And no one can make out that he was murdered. What's the game? Are you gone crazy or something? Listen, I tell you, I didn't kill him. And stop making that noise, you fool! Here, wait a minute. What's the game? Not so fast. On ticket of leave, you say? Mayor, Mel, Mayor. Masters. Is that the man? No, Master Rick. Oh, Master Rick. Master Rick. Master Rick. No, nobody of that name on license here. But this is where he used to live. Yes, we thought... Well, when do you say he came out? Two or three days ago. Oh, why not come back on Friday? He may have been in by then. Well, where do we go from here? This is your party, you're the boss. The man's lying. Peter. All right, right. Then come come on, please, you must believe All me. All right. Why, Mr. Mastery? I found this man in suspicious circumstances running away from Brian's walk. That's right, he's mad. Quiet. What have you got to say? I haven't done anything, sir. I, I was only looking for somebody. What is the charge against this man, Woody? Well, I don't rightly know. He's queer. What do you mean, queer? Well, he started shouting and... Well, what about it? Is it a crime to shout? Did he do anything else? Has he attacked you? Has he stolen something? No, sir, but... Well, then what have you got against this man? You've had him brought in here, you've got to charge him with something. Yes. You can't go about arresting people just it's because they feel matter. like shouting. What's he done? Nothing, as far as I can see. Just a minute. In fact, this gentleman has a very strong case against you. 
defamation of character, wrongful arrest and detention. And in case you don't know it, my good man, the penalty for that yes, is... Yes, sir, but I never... too late to make apologies. Damage is done. Would you like me to take this case, sir? I'm a solicitor and I'm entirely at your disposal. No, We I... can reclaim very heavy damages. But look here, sir. I never wanted to make no trouble. And if you don't mind, I think I'll better be getting back to the wolf. All right, my man. You may go. But let this be a lesson to you. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. You may not get away with this Weasley next time. No. How am I doing? Fine. Do you mind if I have a word now? Not at all, Sergeant. Go ahead. It's your police station. Thanks. Well, as a man of law, you are doubtless aware of the penalties for interfering with the police in the execution of their duty. I should think tonight's bit of oratory will cost you about ten years. Or ten shillings. Charlie, give the gentleman the box. Oh, Sergeant, you are a kind man. Don't you think so, Peter? Oh, charming. Oh, I went with an orphanage anyway. The time I opened my big mouth, I put my foot in it. Sooner or later, I shall find him and prove it. Well, clever. Now do you believe him? He's always like this, just naturally slow. See, you get the money for the story. And I'll get that off in the morning. You can see the article before we print it, and you can alter anything you don't like. I really didn't like any of it. I think there are much better ways of spending a quarter of one's lifetime. Don't you? Mr. Maastricht, this Fred Smith angle you've been telling us about... See, it's beginning to filter through. I, I, I don't see how you can find him. You can't just go looking around without some definite plan. If you could only find the ship, the, the, the Chester, you'd have somewhere to start from. They say there's no such ship, but I know there is. I saw it. I can only wish you the best of luck, sir. I hope he isn't dead. It would be a terrific break for me if you could find him. You can always come along to the office, and I can see if I can help you in any way. All right, I will. But I promise you that story one day. But it won't cost you a hundred pounds this time. somewhere and get married. I'll say something, even if it's only no. Jill! Jill, where are you? Don't make so much noise. You'll wake everybody up. What are you doing in there? Where are we? Just wanted to have a look at it, that's all. This is where he used to live. Where who used to live? Maastricht. I jotted down the address while he was telling you that story. Funny, isn't it? We're standing in the place where it started all those years ago. What's funny about it? It had to start somewhere. I couldn't care less where it started. Where it's going to end, that worries me. But, Peter, in a way, part of it did end here. This is the place where Maastricht's whole life was broken up. The place where he last saw his little girl. I wonder what happened to her. Mm. I've just thought of something. Oh, no, no more ideas tonight. Why don't we find her for him? To be a good news angle for the story and think how pleased Maastricht will be. It's no go. Been all over that with your old man. He won't hear about it. You know, that's the trouble with G.S. He never thinks any of my ideas are any good unless he thinks them first himself. I told him the kid would be a good angle, just like you said, but... 
I've got it. Look. I've got it, I've got it, I've got it. Peter, what's the matter? You're not mad. Suppose he'd made a mistake. What are you talking about? Now do you see? See what? Old Maastricht goes looking for a ship named the Chester. He finds there's no such ship. He thinks everybody's lying, but he goes on looking. But suppose he had made a mistake. Suppose the name of the ship was the Colchester, the Rochester, or the Dorchester. There's a dozens of places ending in the name Chester. It could have been any one of them. Remember, he'd only seen the name just for a second from a moving car. It's a mistake that could easily be made. Peter, you're wonderful. We must tell him. Come on, we'll get him before he goes to bed. And tomorrow he can look up the register of shipping. Come on. a chap named Smith once, but uh, he wasn't a donkey man, he was a greaser, if I remember right. And I don't think his name was Fred. Might have been, but I can't remember. Uh, a dark man? Now, nah, should I know? It's years ago. I only remember his name because of his shouting. That's right. Yes. He used to have terrible nightmares at night. Keep us all awake. Shouting and yelling. Thought somebody was running after him, trying to kill him every night. <laughs> it's all coming back to me now. He used to shout in his sleep about a bloke named Masters or Masterson or something. Yes, yes, that's right. That's right. Where should I find him? How should I know? It's donkey's years ago. Wait a bit, though. He used to have a girl or something ashore down Tilbury Way. Old Eddie would know about that. He used to be pretty friendly with him once. Eddie! Eddie, got a minute? Eddie, you remember that chap that used to have the nightmares on the Trinidad run? Yeah. Used to be pretty friendly with him once. Remember what he did with that girl of his? You know, the one that used to kick up all that fuss when he went around with other women. A dark bit with a bad temper. Remember where she lived? This is the room. You ain't one of her friends, are you? I don't think she's been up very long. I'll give her a call. Doris, somebody wants you. Make yourself comfortable. She'll be down in a minute. What do you want? I want Fred Smith, Doris. Why, oh, Tom? Where is he? Oh, Tom, I, I never expected to. Oh, where did he get out? You never wrote. I thought you was never going to forgive me. Why didn't you let me know you was coming? Come and sit down. Uh, I'm sorry the place is so untidy. I never used to be, did I? Come on, come and sit down and tell me all about yourself. It's been such a long time. Where's Fred Smith? But don't let's talk about that rotter. He's caused us enough trouble, hasn't he? Let's forget about him. You're back now. That's all that matters, isn't it, Tom? Everything's gonna be different now. I know what you've been through for me. But I'll make it up to you, honest I will. I'm sorry you found me looking like this. You caught me unaware. Do you remember how fussy I used to be about me in the old days? You used to say it was pretty then, didn't you, Tom? But it won't take me long to get it right. I, I can soon make it nice again. Where's Smith? Fred Smith, that louse. I ate him. He broke up our life once, but he's not going to do it again. Nobody's ever going to come between us now. You're going to give me another chance, aren't you, Tom? I'm sorry for what I did. I must have been mad. I paid for it. You paid for it. You've paid for it, have you? What do you think I've been doing? What about my life? The life they took away because you wouldn't come forward to say you were still alive. You were willing to see me rot, weren't you? 
Willing to see me put inside for something I never did? Why, you... years ago. He's got a pub now, Gravesend. The Royal George. Let him go. Let me give you a drink. I'll have one too. A drink to the future. Our future, Tom. By the way, how's Jill? A small gin, please. This house belongs to Mr. Smith. That's right. You must be a stranger around here if you don't know our friend. Oh, I know him all right. Thank you. Double gin, please. That doubles me. Let's have a single one, then. Shaky tonight, Fred. Have you seen a ghost or something? What you want? Hello, Fred. Why have you come here? Oh, I just dropped in to have a drink. Nice place you got here, Fred. I didn't know you were coming up. No, I don't suppose you did, but you knew I'd be out one day, didn't you? Oh, I'd have been down to see you before, and it was a bit of a job to find out where you were. You know, you're sort of buried alive down here, aren't you? Could, Could you use a tenant, Tom? No, thanks. Not sore at me, are you? <laughs> Why should I be? After all, there's never yet been a sore that took 15 years to heal. I'd have come forward before. Tom the trialer. Only I was at sea. I didn't hear about it until it was too late. Too late for what, Fred? Oh, to explain. I see. How's Doris? Oh, she's... Uh, she's dead. Dead? Five years ago. Why don't you take it to tenner, Tom? Fifteen into ten won't go, Fred. You ought to know that. What do you mean? Well, ten pounds, that's two hundred shillings, divided by fifteen is about 
13 bob, isn't it? Is that all you think I'm worth, Fred? 13 shillings a year? Besides, it's not a very lucky number, is it? <laughs> Morning, Miss Sullivan. Morning, Miss Carter. Is my father in? I'm sorry, Miss Sullivan. We've gone to a conference. Can I take a message? No, it doesn't matter. I'll see Mr. Rogers. Shut that door! Only people would be more careful instead of barging in and out, interfering with people who are trying to do a little work. Hello. Hello, Peter. Is it a private game or can anyone join in? Everyone is joining in. So this is the way you write your masterpieces? I always work on the floor. You have to be a Chinese reporter. Is it easier that way? It is here. What are you writing now? How to give baby his first bath by a young mother. Peter, you've been holding out on me. I'm always left holding the baby in this place. <laughs> what did Daddy think of the Maastricht article? Don't talk to me about that old man of yours. What's he done now? After all the trouble I had getting that story, he's decided he doesn't want to use it. Just wanted to give Maastricht a hundred pounds. Well, that's kind of him. Shows he's got a soft heart. The soft thing about GS is his teeth. I can always get on with my baby craft. Trouble with you is you don't know how to handle Daddy. He's a lamb, really. Why did you always go about in wolf's clothing? Oh, I'm sorry, my darling. What did I do to you? You wouldn't believe it if I told you. Good morning. Oh, good morning, Mr. Maastricht. I was uh, just showing Miss Sullivan some uh, jujitsu. Uh, in case anyone ever tried to kiss me. I see. It's a very useful thing to know. I'm glad I found you in because I've got something for you. You remember that story I promised you? You haven't found him? Yes. Oh, that's wonderful. Now you can clear yourself. Yes. Well, this is front page stuff. What are we waiting here for? Let's get the Home Secretary. No, no, no. Now, wait. I, I want to do this my way. And what's that? Well, I, I've always promised myself that the first person to see Fred Smith alive should be the man who proved he was dead. And that's Crossley. This is terrific. What a build-up. Crossley. There's something about him in today's paper. Yes, here it is. 25 years of bar and bench. On Friday, Mr. Justice Crossley celebrates a legal jubilee. It is 25 years since he was called to the bar. The learned judge is giving a small dinner party to mark the occasion. Listen, I think I've got something. How about Fred Smith, you and me, going to that party? That would shake him. Yes, I... Uh... I rather thought that, too. Boy, oh boy. This is going to make G.S. sit up. But you see, Mr. Smith, we must have your help to prove Mr. Maastricht is innocent. Well, I'd like to help you, but... You see, I can't do anything that's going to get me into the papers. I've got my license to think about. No, there's nothing like that about it, Fred. All we have to do is to see the judge and a few lawyers and make a statement. <laughs> that's all very well. But before you know where you You see, Fred, I've got quite a bit of compensation coming to me. Uh, thousands of pounds, perhaps, and, and, well, I thought you and I might go halves. Well, Tom, I'd, I'd like to help you if I could. Do you have to give me a day or two to think it over? I don't know about that. Uh, this judge fellow is expecting us tonight, and, well, if you can't come along, I shall have to go alone. Yes, and then you'd have the police and reporters and everyone down here, and we don't want that, do you? You on the level, Tom? Not spending the cash? Of course I am. 50-50. All right. I'll come. Well, here we are. Yes, it won't be long. You sure it's going to be all right, Tom? Of course it's going to be all right. Well, come on in. Let's get it over. Yes, let's get it over. Good luck, Mr. Maastricht. Thank you, Jim. 
I think I can say, my dear fellow, that in all my 25 years' experience of criminal courts, I know of no doubtful charge in which the prisoner has not been given the benefit of that doubt. What is it, Blender? There's a man called Maastricht outside, sir. He says it's important and that you would see him. Well, that's extraordinary. The very man we've been talking about has just arrived. Have him in, Crossley. He's probably only come to beg a fiver. <laughs> no, I told him if he ever got any news to come and see me. He's accompanied by a man named Frederick Smith, sir. What? That's the name of the man he murdered. Show them in. Maastricht served a life sentence for killing the very man he has brought here tonight. Good evening, Maastricht. Good evening. I must say this is a great surprise to yes, me. Yes, I expect it is. And uh, this is Frederick Smith, is it? Yes. yes sir. I take it you will be able to prove this gentleman's identity? I can. So you are actually the man whom Maastricht was once accused of killing? That's right, sir. Well, I uh, couldn't come forward before because, uh, well, I didn't know about it, see? Well, Maastricht, every one of my guests here tonight is intimately connected with the profession of law. In fact, I doubt whether any man ever had such an array of legal talent disposed to help him. I see. And uh, how do you reckon to help? Can you give me back my 15 years? That, I'm afraid, is beyond our power. All right. Then what are you going to do? It's evident, of course, you have a first-class claim against the state. Claim? Claim? Do you mean money? Of course. What else can we do? There's no return to yesterday. Yes, yes, Grassley. But before you go any further, perhaps I might interpose a few remarks. We at this table are all members of the same profession. And the duty of each of us lies in the interests of justice. No one doubts that from time to time there are miscarriages of justice. Its laws were made by man and are therefore not perfect. Oh, surely, but... my dear fellow, it's man who is not perfect. The laws are all right. It's the people who break them who are wrong. But uh, I, I never broke any law. Yes, 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 my good man. But uh, surely Selby was talking about specific cases in which, for some reason or other, a definite... Never mind all this talking. What about my 15 years? I remember in Rex versus Hartigan, it was clearly proved My dear chap, you can hardly cite Rex versus Hartigan as a precedent for the reversal of a verdict. Now, if I remember rightly, surely... You never remember yeah. anything rightly, Ferrers, unless you got your clerk to remind you. As I was saying, in Rex versus Hartigan, the Lords of Appeal laid it down quite oh, clearly... Oh, stop it! Words, words, words. It was words that got me into jail and robbed me of 15 years of my life. I told you in that courtroom that I never killed Fred Smith. But you, you wouldn't have it, would you? Because in so many words, you proved I had. You lagged me for 15 whole years for something that I never did. You robbed me of my home and stole my little daughter from me. You did it all with words. You turned me into a dead man that had to go on living in a world that I never made. And you're trying to do it again, aren't you? But you're not going to, understand? Because this time I've got nothing to lose. This is your problem. And I want to know what you're going to do about it. And I want to know now. <laughs> you don't want to help me, do you? No. I'm a closed account, aren't I? I'm something you'd all rather forget. Because a 15-year-old mistake is best forgotten, isn't it? But I didn't forget. No. And you, sir, you're going to remember whether you want to or not. If you persist in this extraordinary attitude, Master Rick, we shall, I am afraid, find it very difficult to advise you. It wasn't difficult to advise the jury that I was guilty, was it? You were pretty certain that I'd done that murder, weren't you? But I hadn't, see? 
Although you had me punished for it just the same. Well, what about Fred Smith? Nobody punished him, did they? Nobody sent him to prison. They couldn't punish you, could they, Fred? Do you know why? Because you're dead. You're a dead man, Fred. Ask Mr. Crossley. He knows. His words made you a dead man as surely as they took away my life. And nothing you or I can say will make any difference. Because you're dead. The law says you are, and the law can't make a mistake, can it, Mr. Crossley? But there is a mistake here, and you and I have got to put it right. You know, the law today is the same as it was 15 years ago, when it said you were dead. And uh, the law is, is the law. You, you do understand, don't you? No, Tom. Don't do it. No. Put it right for you, Mr. Crossley. And I hope you're satisfied. Now, what are you going to do about it? Yes. Yes. What? But it's murder in reverse. And that just doesn't happen. How should I know what they can do? I don't know. This murder's already paid for. What can they do? Mm -hmm. 